For this one, you do. Three, two, nine. That was close. You were within a point. We can do go from 329 to 330 if you want to, Bruce. You know, and Katie just has to learn to play that second one. <laughs> we're going to sing all four verses on this one, you guys. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is In the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, wonder working power. In the blood, in the blood of, the land, of the land, there is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the land. Have a seat. Turn a couple pages up to number 336, and we're going to do the odd verses. Think that over a minute. Thy power to save, I'll sing 
thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Well, my last day of school for summer was this past Thursday. And so when my internal clock went off at 5.30 Friday morning, I had no choice but to get out of bed or wake my wife. So I jumped up and got in the shower, got dressed, and went out into the family room and turned on the TV, which is something I don't usually do. I didn't quite understand that at 6.30 in the morning, there's not much to watch on that boob tube. I watched it until about 8 o'clock and decided that this was way too boring. I couldn't sit still and watch nothing. And so I turned the TV off and wandered around the house for a few minutes trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And finally decided that my barn needed some attention. And so I put on my shoes, put on my ratty old blue jeans, and went out to the barn. I grabbed a broom and started sweeping up a little bit some grass that I had left there from the lawn mower and some sawdust from the table saw, and then saw an old chewed up black bag behind the table saw that I wasn't sure I had seen before. And so I stopped, I picked up the bag, and laid it up on top of the table saw. And in that old black bag, I found a couple of aluminum baseball bats and an old ball glove with a softball still inside it. The leather on the glove was dirty, but it was still fairly soft. And because the ball was still inside the glove, it held its shape to the ball. I put my hand in it, and like most dumb kids, I threw the ball the six inches from my right hand to my left hand a few times and decided that the glove was still very useful. Dirty, old, a little bit worn, but much better than I could ever ask a new ball glove to be. I believe that our bodies are very similar to that old ball glove. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, it tells us, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outler, outler, yes, outwardly, our tongues are wasting away as well. It's your glasses, Paul. <laughs> though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So just remember, next time you're feeling old and worthless, your strength does not come from your body, for it will surely die. But your strength comes from the Lord and grows stronger every day. Let's sing our last song, number 657. Verses 1, 2, and 4. Oh, 
Some of Jesus' dinner guests were quite surprising. Early in his ministry, he ate with a large number of tax collectors and sinners. People would shake their heads and think there's no way that this man can be righteous, holy, as he claims to be. Once when he was at dinner with a Pharisee of all people, a woman of the city known to be a lady of the night came into the house, made a spectacle of herself, took oil and anointed his feet and wiped it up with her hair. Even the disciples at the Last Supper were not models for you and I to emulate. Some of them began to argue among themselves as to who would be the greatest in the kingdom. Peter was told that he would shortly deny that he even knew Jesus. And of course our old buddy Judas was there as well. And now we're here tonight at the Lord's table. And I wonder what kind of dinner companions we are. Sometimes faithless, sometimes proud, sometimes lustful, sometimes cruel, sometimes clueless about what discipleship actually means. And if we look around us or beside us, we might think to ourselves, I wish I could be more like so-and-so. I wish I could have the talent to do what he or she can do. And then think about this Tuesday. Many, many people.
people are going to try and obtain an office, an opportunity to serve others. And many, many are going to be disappointed because they will not get enough votes. Votes. Aren't you glad it doesn't take votes to come to this table? Isn't it wonderful to know that we don't have to go around our neighborhoods and get public consensus to say, yes, they can go and be there? Aren't you glad that you don't have to achieve some level of talent or ability to be accepted by God? We're invited to this table tonight, not because of what we've done, but because of what God has done for us. So we come tonight knowing that Jesus welcomes us and promises us that if we confess our sins, he will cleanse us from our unrighteousness and offer us his forgiveness. Would you pray with me, please? Father, such a simple meal that has so much meaning. And it's so obvious why you've asked us to remember this so often, because for all of our attempts to explain and relate, we always fall short of what this table really, really means. But you know our hearts and you know the struggles that we have in trying to explain, trying to appreciate, trying to express our gratefulness. And because of your wisdom, you see and accept our pitiful attempts to say thank you. Tonight, as we take from that wafer that represents your body how thankful we are for your willingness to go to Calvary and when that juice passes our lips how amazing to think that you were willing to give up your life blood so that we might have life eternal Bless us tonight as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Katie. I wish we'd have had church last Sunday night just so we could have listened. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. With each Sunday night that passes, I, I get a little teary thinking, hoping that wherever I land, I'll be able to convince those saints of God 
to do something that they probably haven't done in a long time, and that's have evening service. I can just hear them now. What? You want us to come to church at night? So, I'll be thinking about you guys. And uh, who knows? If your new preacher doesn't want to have evening service, I can come back. <laughs> Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Last uh, two weeks ago, we talked about music for a madman. Tonight, we're going to talk about how to kill a giant. Not a woodchuck, giant. So before we begin, let's uh, please uh, pause with me for a word of prayer. Merciful Father in heaven, we're grateful this evening to be able to come into your house. What a joy it is to sing your praises, to listen to the talent that comes from an instrument, and to be able to visit with brothers and sisters in Christ. But now as we come to this section, an opportunity for your word to speak to our hearts, I pray that the author of this text, your Holy Spirit, would be invited in to every heart and every mind. And as we allow him to come in, that then he just goes to work speaking to us about what this text means, all the ramifications that it has for us as individuals so that we could be changed and prepared to live for you this week in Jesus' name. Amen. As they looked across the Ela Valley, they saw on the other side men to whom they would engage in battle soon. The Israelites were on one slope, the Philistines on the other, and in between was a valley, and in the valley was a ravine, and in the ravine was a dry creek bed. Soon that battle, valley would be a battlefield, and the story begins this way in 1 Samuel 17, beginning in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their uh, armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succoth which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Sukkah and Azekah in um, that place there. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side while the Israelites stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. They're here in this place in this position in many ways because of Jonathan. It was Jonathan, Saul's son, that precipitates the war with the Philistines that are occupying the land of Israel. Saul sees his army dissolve before his eyes, remember back in chapter 13, and he disobeys God by failing to wait for Samuel to offer a burnt offering. And then Jonathan initiates an attack on a Philistine outpost in chapter 14, and that results in divine intervention by means of an earthquake. The battle against the Philistines could have won, been won decisively, except for Saul and another one of his bonehead moves when he said to all of his army, you can't eat until this battle is over. Well, in their weakened state, it cost them a victory. And now the Philistines were back and spoiling for a fight, except they really did not want to fight in the hills because their chariots were useless in this terrain. Both sides seem reluctant to engage in anything more than boasting, and this stalemate appears to have no resolution. Suddenly, the Israelites see something moving down the slope. It's something big. I mean, huge. 
And even without glasses, they can see this thing. But what is it? Enormous. And it's covered with glittering bronze. The thing got to the middle near the ravine, and suddenly a shudder ran through the men of Israel. It was a man, the biggest man they had ever, ever, ever seen. First Samuel describes him in detail. A champion came out, it says in verse 4, from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now that doesn't mean anything to us. I don't know if I even have wrenches that are cubits. Whatever that is. But I'll tell you what it means in our language. You convert that to our system of measurement, it means he was nine feet nine inches tall. Wow. Nine feet nine. So we're told some other things about him. His name, of course, was Goliath. He's covered from head to toe in armor. He wore a bronze helmet and a bronze coat of armor that weighed nearly 125 pounds. He wore bronze shin guards, had a bronze javelin slung over his back. His spear was like a weaver's beam, meaning it was a thick shaft of wood, like a small log. The head of the spear had an iron point that weighed 17 pounds. Ahead of him marched a soldier carrying a shield large enough to protect Goliath's body. He kept a shield in front of him that was nine foot tall. It must have had little teeny holes <laughs> so he could see where he was going. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the danger of the battle, that would have been funny to watch this shield moving. <laughs> you couldn't see anything behind it. Having gotten their attention, this is what Goliath says in verses 8 through 10. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants, liars. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Goliath says, am I not a Philistine? The Hebrew text actually reads, am I not the Philistine. Arrogance drips off every word. Now what would you do? Would you go and fight him? I mean, let's say that you're 5'8", maybe 5'10", 25 years old. You're not a professional soldier. You're a farmer or carpenter, some kind of a skilled laborer. You've got a wife and three kids at home. Would you go and fight Goliath? <laughs> It'd be suicide. At least that's the way the men of Israel felt. Look at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Why? Because even Saul understands now that he is all on his own. He wanted to do his own thing. He didn't want to listen to Samuel. He didn't want to wait for God. He said, I can handle this. And God said, okay. Good luck. It's all I knew, buddy. And the Spirit of the Lord had left him. And without the Spirit of the Lord, Saul has nothing with which to face the giant. God had lifted the divine energy shield for Saul, and now he's filled with terror. And so the challenge went unmet. Goliath went back to his camp, but it's not over, not by a long shot. Look at verse 16. The Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. Goliath came out 40 days straight, twice a day, morning and night, 
to challenge the men of Israel, and each day it was the same. No one would answer the challenge. God's people were losing the battle before it even started. I mean, every single day, he was taking their confidence down a notch until they began to feel completely useless. We're not going to win because we've got to fight him first. I imagine that the military men of Israel got together each night and tried to formulate a plan. I'm sure they talked strategy and tactics. Saul was there along with Big Abner. Remember Big Abner? In the top brass. Maybe even they set up a little model battlefield, you know, they had two clumps of dirt that was supposed to represent the mountains. And they had this valley, and they had a great, great big, big stick. That was huge. And that was Goliath. They probably prayed, oh God, help us defeat the Philistines. And the next day would come, and they would line up along the lip of the valley. Goliath would come out, yell and swear, and the whole army would run away. For 40 days, no one knew what to do. Listen, it only takes one giant to stop you as long as you look at life from a level ground. If you look at life from a human level, it only takes one giant to stop you. Our eyes see a giant up ahead and suddenly he fills the whole screen until the giant is all we can see. At ground level, giants unglue us and we can't go on. The problem is not how big the giant is, it's how small he makes us feel. So small that we don't have a chance. Giants defeat us not because they're big, but because they make us feel small. Enter David, the hero of the story. But when we meet him, he's not the hero, he's the errand boy. By this time, David is back tending the sheep where Jesse thought he belonged. Not some palace playing a harp. Gee. What kind of a job is that for a kid that has a real talent with critters? His three oldest brothers are in the army because they're men. But David's father, Jesse, wants to get a report from the battlefield, so he decides to send David with some food for his brothers. But actually, it's a hefty load. Now, oh, David's just a kid. We figured he was about 10 when Samuel anointed him, and we don't know how many years have passed, but he's still just into his teenage years. And he's supposed to carry five pounds of roasted grain, ten loaves of bread, ten cheeses. And he has to walk 18 miles from Bethlehem to the Elah Valley. You better get there, boy. He gets there just as Goliath is making his daily rounds for the 40th time. This is pretty old stuff by now. Goliath comes out. He makes a few threats. He curses the men of Israel. And then he goes back to uh, uh, sit down, throw back a couple of cold ones. But this time, things are going to be different. David hasn't heard a thing about Goliath and his challenge. He's just excited to be on the battlefield and away from those stinking sheep. So he asks, what's going on? How come everybody is just standing around? Man, even your weapons are stacked up. Looks like you haven't even been using them. Why doesn't somebody take care of that loudmouth down there? Look at the answer in verse 25. 
The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now notice David's answer because it is the key to this whole story in verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Wait a minute, did you get that? The armies of the living God? He didn't say the armies of Israel. He didn't say the armies of Saul. He said the armies of the living God. That makes all the difference in the world. The soldiers are saying, do you see that guy? I mean, he's like a mountain out there. You wouldn't last five seconds. David, don't, don't you see him? Yeah, David sees him. But he also sees something else that nobody in the army of Israel had seen. David saw that Goliath was not only defying Israel, he was defying Israel's God. David looks at life differently. Israel saw Goliath, that brazen giant, as an immovable object. David saw him from God's point of view. He's blocking the way of God. Let's go get him. David was no match for Goliath, but when that uncircumcised Philistine took on God, he got in over his head. This is not overconfidence or big talk. No, it's entirely different. This is a man that sees Goliath from above. It's like looking at Shaquille O'Neal from the top of the Sears Tower. At ground level, you look up at him over seven foot tall. But from the top of the Sears Tower, you need binoculars to see him. David's screen was filled with God. And therefore, everything else was whittled down to proper size. He saw Goliath, but he also saw God, and that made all the difference. But before he goes after Goliath, he's got to convince the doubters. And the first one is his older brother, Eliab, who questions David's motives. Look in verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you've come down in order to see the battle. All right, there's some brotherly love if you've ever seen it. What are you doing here, you loser? Get back there with those sheep. That's the only thing you can lead. Eliab's problem is twofold. First, he's a jerk. Second, he's a coward. He can't stand the thought that his stepbrother could do something he couldn't do. So David answered in the words of younger brothers and sisters everywhere. <laughs> Listen to this. If you are a younger brother or sister, you heard this before. David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? What are you so upset? I just asked the question. Sound familiar? Ever have that in your household? What have I done? I love it. The Bible, it's so true to life. But still, he wasn't ready to go to fight Goliath because word comes to Saul that at last a man has been found. A man has been found. And when Saul finds out it's David, he can't believe it. David, in his eyes, is just a kid. He's not a man. There's no chance in the world that he's going to beat Goliath. And so he tells David, you're only a boy. And he's been a fighting man from his youth. And David's answer is classic in verses 34 through 36. David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. And I went out after him and attacked him 
and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. You see, there would have been a lot of shepherds in that day that if a lion or bear came and picked up a lamb, well, you just mark it as a loss. A lamb. How many lambs do you think they're going to have in a year? But David... He went after the predators. And he didn't throw stones at them or yell at them from a distance. He went right up, grabbed that lion by the beard and said, buddy, it's over. And took the lamb gently from his mouth before he killed him. That's an amazing picture. Behind these brave words lies an important truth. Every giant in your path is also in God's path if you're going in his direction. Did you catch that? Every giant in your path is also in God's path if you're going in God's direction. If you're in the will of God, the giants who fight you are actually fighting God. And that's why God sends giants in our path on a regular basis. First, to see if we are going to run or fight. And second, to allow us an opportunity to honor our God. So off he goes into battle with his staff and his sling. And as he heads down the slope, he pauses at the creek bed to pick up five smooth stones. And when I was putting this together, it's been a while ago, I had thought, and then by this time I've forgotten, I was going to pick up a, a, a pool ball from the youth room, just so you could get a visual. We tend to romanticize this part of the story. But the sling in David's day was a deadly weapon. And we've covered this a number of times, but allow me to remind you again. These stones would be a little larger than two inches in diameter. So think a cue ball or a tennis ball for that size. But stone. In the hands of an expert slinger, the stones could travel accurately about 200 yards. But they could actually travel up to 440 yards, a quarter of a mile away. They could launch those stones. They would leave the sling, beginners, about 60 miles an hour, but experts at 100 miles an hour. You ever watch professional baseball players? Those batters go up and they've got things on their legs and things on their elbows and pads on their shoulders and a big old helmet on their head. But why do they do all that? Because when those pitchers are throwing that 90 feet at 90 plus mile an hour, if they hit you, they can break something. <laughs> if they hit you without a helmet, well, that, that, your baseball career is over. Your life's probably over. These are rocks, 100 miles an hour. And by this time, David is coming near Goliath, and behind his shoulder, the whole army is watching. And as he walked, Goliath got bigger and bigger and bigger. On the other side, somebody spots David, and the Philistines start laughing. Another fellow starts taking bets on how long it's going to take Goliath to snap him in two. But before they could fight, there was one more thing they had to do. In single combat, the fighters would first yell at each other. It was sort of an Old Testament way of uh, 
trash talking. They just didn't go in to fight. When you were by yourself, mano y mano, you just didn't start fighting. First, you built each other, or well, tore each other down with your mouth. <laughs> so Goliath says to David, come on over here, and I'm going to feed you to the birds and the beasts. Notice how David answers back in 45 through 47. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. I will strike you down, remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. That's a little bit different trash talking. David didn't say a thing about what he could do. He says, let me tell you what God's going to do to you. <laughs> and it's not going to be pretty. This is one of the great statements of faith in all of the Bible. What David says God is going to do. And with that, David suddenly starts to run. And as he runs, he puts a stone in his sling and bingo. The stone came in right between the eyes and lodged in his forehead. Now, I don't believe that it was totally David's skill. I think somebody was guiding that missile. And at 100 miles an hour, Goliath never knew what hit him. Such a thing had never entered his mind before. One moment he's watching David run, and next everything goes black, and with a mighty crash, he falls to the ground, stoned out of his mind. Pretty good, huh? Look at verse 50. Then David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. One other little detail. David promised to cut off his head, but he didn't have a sword. So he borrows Goliath because he's not going to use it. Meanwhile, the soldiers on both sides can't believe what they've just seen. From the north end of the valley, the men of Israel are cheering and whooping and hollering. And on the other side, sheer panic. Here come the Israelis. There go the Philistines. It was a slaughter. The road back to Gath was littered with dead Philistines. And the Jews went back to the battlefield and plundered the Philistine tents. All because one person saw life from God's perspective. A whole nation saved, revived, and energized because a young shepherd dared to see life from the top down. David arrived early in the morning an errand boy, and by evening he was a national hero. For that one act of bravery, he was enshrined in the history of Israel forever. Never again would he be taken for granted. Never again would he be overlooked. So I want to ask and answer three questions and then we'll be done. The first is this. What would qualify as a giant for you tonight? Sometimes we find ourselves in situations similar to the one in which David found himself in a valley, alone, facing a giant. And the point to remember is the one that David made in verse 26 and again in verse 36 and again in verse 45. In defying the armies of Israel, Goliath was actually defying the God of Israel. And what appeared to be a purely military conflict turns out to be a spiritual conflict as well. We may face exactly the kind of conflict this week. In fact, there are numerous warnings in the New Testament to expect opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
Consider Acts 14, 22. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, to devour. And remember Paul's sober words in 2 Timothy 3, 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We need not think of persecution in a narrow or limited sense. The whole Christian life is one battle after another. And most of us will face a whole army of giants before the story is fully told. So to answer the basic question, a giant is any situation in our path which blocks the way that our God wants us to go. There's the second critical question. Why does God put giants in our path? Primarily because men grow up on the battlefield and we will never grow up until we dare to go out and face Goliath head on. There is nothing like a war that turns a child into an adult. And as long as we turn tail and run when the giant rears his head, we'll have to face him tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. He won't go away until we stand up and fight him. Whenever we stand up to a giant and fight him in the name of the Lord, mighty miracles begin to take place. And God wants us to grow up, and we can't until we go out and fight in the name of the Lord of hosts. So it sounds strange, but... Giants are absolutely necessary for our spiritual growth. As long as we cower in the rocks instead of going down into the valley, we can never become all that God intends us to be. And then one final question. What lesson was God trying to teach David? You might say it many ways, but at the heart it was the lesson of faith. David had to learn what faith in God could do because Faith plus nothing and minus nothing is faith in God's power. The truth comes into focus if we ask what might seem like an obvious question. At what point did Goliath die? When did David kill him? Well, say, that's easy. When he cut off his head. No. Not really. Well, when the stone hit him. No, not even then. Go back a little bit. Was it when he picked up the five smooth stones? No. Was it when he told Goliath what he was going to do? Uh uh. But you're getting closer. Was it when he refused to wear Saul's armor? No, no, but not, now you've passed over it. Between those two events, something critical happened. Samuel 17, 40 tells us that after David picked up the five stones, he approached the Philistine. When he took that first step, Goliath was a dead man. You get it? He just didn't know it yet. Goliath had no idea what was coming. David won the victory with that first step, and the rest is history. He possessed Goliath's head while it was still attached to Goliath's shoulders. He never had a chance. Did David know something the other men of Israel didn't know? No. They knew that God was the God of power, the God of might, the God of miracles. They knew that he was the Lord of hosts. It wasn't a matter of knowledge. Any one of them could have killed Goliath if they had been willing to take that first step in the name of the Lord. The difference between David and the other soldiers was not that he had faith and they had doubts or that they had doubts and he had none. The difference is this. David acted on his belief and ignored his doubts while they acted on their doubts and ignored their belief. 
Faith is not waiting for 100% assurance. Faith is not waiting until all your doubts are gone because if you're going to wait for that, you'll wait forever. Faith is seeing the giant, understanding the odds, believing that God wants him dead, and then taking that first step. If you can do that, the rest is easy. Now, what giants stand in your way tonight? Think about how the giants of circumstance and opposition have combined to keep you enslaved to fear and sometimes have driven you almost to the brink of despair. How much longer are you going to hide in the rocks of fear? When are you going to step into the valley and face the giant eyeball to eyeball? But that giant is big, you say. Yeah, that's why they call him a giant. He's frightening. I'm sure he is. I might get hurt if I stand up against him. You might. That's true. You know, there are a thousand reasons to run away when Goliath stands up. But whenever you're tired of running, the Lord stands ready to walk into the valley with you. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we have that assurance and we know that scripture oh so well in the 23rd Psalm. David knew those lessons and he put them to use. His faith in you at times was amazing. And yet we have that wonderful assurance of knowing that he wasn't superhuman. He was just a man like us, full of faults, full of sins, full of shortcomings and failures. But he knew where to go when he fell short, and that was to the feet of his God. And for us, we come to the foot of the cross. And because we've laid our burdens there and brought our sins and confessed them to you tonight, we have that promise of forgiveness. So let us take the power that you have given to us internally and the faith that you're growing in our hearts and send us out this week to do your will and your bidding for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.